Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you came today, and uh, we hope that the Lord will bless you and be with you today and, and touch you. Um, it's a, it's a hard thing when we have our loved ones die, and many of you have had friends and loved ones die, and, and uh, you remember them. Even, even sometimes after 30 years, they're gone. You still miss them, you know, weekly. And that's okay. It, it, it honors them, the fact that you love them as much and so forth. But, you know, there's sorrow, but not as if we don't have any hope. Uh, and we sorrow, but we know that they're with the Lord. And we're so thankful for that. And uh, I pray God today will help you open your heart and receive uh, the message. One thing I I did want to draw your attention to is we do have uh, Sunday school classes. This is March and they're starting up. And um, there are several of them, some new classes. Rhea Adamson's teaching a class. Dan Prevett and uh, Pastor Austin and Pastor Brian are doubling up to, to, to teach a class. And and Brother Tostin has got a terrific class, as well as Nicole Hasso. Grab the education brochure, uh, if you would. And then if you're kind of new and you haven't gone through with Pastor Kerry Mission 101, it's really a good fundamental four-week class that you could take. And that's also beginning, and we hope that you'll take part of that. The Hill, Hill family is back from being on a time away, which they needed. Pastor Jeff has done many, many funerals, most every week for weeks, and he's been carrying a heavy, heavy load. And so we're so glad, Pastor Jeff, to have you back and Jeannie and in your family. And we know that uh, we're, we'll be all praying for you as you carry the bulk of the load of the church. And uh, you, have, you have the best senior pastor in the nation, if you don't know it. He's a godly man who cares deeply. And Pastor Brian as well and, and, our, other, and our other pastors. You know, one of the younger pastors said to me, uh, you know, I, I, I respect people and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but when I, when I dress like you're dressing here today, Pastor Weaver, I don't feel like it's not me because I didn't grow up with that culture as a teenager. So I don't, I don't feel like I'm, it, it's not me. And so I understand that. Um, if you haven't seen the Jesus Revolution movie, how many have seen it? please, no matter what your age, go to it. Because it reminds me that people are look what they're looking for. Wherever they look in the wrong direction, wherever they look in the wrong places, they're looking for God. And the hippie movement, I was... I was, I, I experienced that Jesus revolution. I was in college. We saw it at Baylor University. In fact, half of the, of the Southern Baptist churches in Waco, Texas are spirit-filled churches. And it almost split the Texas uh, Baptist Convention over that whole idea because the Holy Spirit was blowing all across America for the Jesus revolution. And it was a powerful thing. And they, we were singing songs that were different with guitars and made up songs and straight from scripture. How many, how many are a part of that remember that, right? And, and it didn't matter. We had people coming into the, the church uh, that didn't look like everybody else, but it didn't matter because it's not about what's on the outside, but on the inside that matters. And, and um, this, this, is, uh, this is my upbringing culture. And, and I, I don't wear a suit so that I look holy. It's because I grew up, and to me, this means something to me when I'm preaching. But it's not because I want to impress you on the outside. Because on the inside, I'm a broken little boy. And I have brokenness. And I'm not trying to hide something. If you could picture a beautiful red car. It's a... A classic American muscle car. It's shiny and it's perfect. There's not a dent and it's shining. It's an older car. And on the outside, it's amazing. Then you open the hood and you look in and the, the motor's the rusty. The motor, it looks like there's problem and damage, you know. And the car gets you from point A to point B, but that car needs help on the inside. I don't care who you are. If you need help on the inside, there's a surgeon 
a physician with such exacting abilities to reach into your heart and do spiritual surgery and to fix whatever's going on, the pain, the loss, the suffering, the struggle, past hurts, being victims as a children, as a child, and uh, God wants to do healing. I came back from Ethiopia where the Holy Spirit is heavy. And almost 25 years ago, we took an offering and helped build a Bible college there. That Bible college has 700 students and has trained ministers around that whole nation. Every denomination, there is no other Bible college, every denomination in Ethiopia sends their ministry students to the Ethiopia Assemblies of God Bible College in Addis Ababa. And because they've all been trained there, every denomination, every denomination is spirit-filled. And the Holy Spirit is blowing across Ethiopia. And you guys gave to this, if you'll remember. And God did a mighty work. And there are 30 million full gospel, Holy Spirit-filled believers in Ethiopia. And there's a sweeping of the Holy Spirit. And missions matters. Missions do matter. Giving. Thank you. And on my campus, Baylor University, there's a revival that has broken out. It's happening before, and it is breaking out. And it's breaking out around, I understand, last Sunday in the 11, they were here till 1 o'clock. The Holy Spirit was moving, and the power of God's Spirit. And we have to decide we're going to yield ourselves and not not just do church as usual, but be open to a move in the Holy Spirit in our life to quicken us. You say, well, you say the move of the Holy Spirit. Yes, because Jesus said, I go away, but it's good if I go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. In other words, if Jesus was on earth, he could only be with you or maybe in our church today, but the other churches would be left out because Jesus wouldn't be there. But Jesus went and he sent his Holy Spirit that's among us and in us and moving around us. And he wants to stir your heart. He wants to take truth and pierce our heart and cut us open to take a look inside at whatever might need to be dealt with in our lives that he would deal with it. And today I hope that you will open your heart and receive from the word of God Hold up the word of God and say, this is the word of God. It's life. It is powerful. And we need to be reading it and mulling on it and thinking on it. This Bible is important. If you look at the Jesus Revolution in that movie, you'll see the hippies on one side and the regular church attenders on the other side. Not, none of them have their Bible, but all the Jesus Revelation, they're loving their Bible. They're holding their Bible. The pastor says, hold it up. It goes up. So I urge you to get your Bibles. You bring them to church and you look in your Bible. It's not just listen to to what I have to say. And I know we have scripture on the screen, which is fine. But I believe God wants to do a deep healing for some people today. And I believe that there, you might be surprised the healing that is okay. And I want my inside to match my outside. Now, some of you are going, Pastor, you don't look that good on the outside. And I'm going, <laughs> right? But you, you know the, the car analogy. And I want a Holy Spirit to help me on the inside. Now, we're working through the book of Genesis, and we come to Genesis 19, if you would take your scripture, uh, and we're going to begin at verse 30 in a minute. Have it ready to go. We're not ready to go there yet, but have it ready, Genesis 19, 30. It's a heavy topic today. In this passage, you see, um, you know, uh, we see incest because Lot's daughters get him drunk and sleep with him to have a baby. And, you know, today I'm going to be talking more than just this, but I might be talking, we're talking about molestation, maybe rape, uh, things that are deep wounds. And, uh, and I, I would say gently to, to think about this, you might, if you've had experiences or maybe at a time when the enemy had a hold of you, you did something wrong and you were the perpetrator, or maybe you were a victim. And maybe you weren't of this, but there's many other things in this message that will challenge you as well. But it's, you know, it's try to forget those wounds. But I want to tell you, you can, you can try to just bury that and not think about it. But Jesus wants to rid you of it where you're really, really free from it and its, and its adverse effects. 
And uh, we need to be uh, ready um, to let the Holy Spirit do heart surgery. And it's a delicate surgery by the Spirit. God doesn't want us just to be a functioning vehicle that looks good on the outside. He wants to heal us on the inside. He wants us to have a life of abundance. He wants to do a work of restoration to our heart, the center of all life, everything. The heart flows from the heart, everything. And without Jesus, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked. And we can't even understand it. Jesus must change our heart. And I, I understand there might be survivors of, of, of abuse or possibly abusers. But God wants to bring healing. He wants to bring wholeness. He wants to bring forgiveness. He wants to transform your mind and your heart. And he wants to deliver you from the chains of embarrassment or guilt that you've worn for years. Victims, it's not their fault. He wants to set you free so that you can step into an abundant life. And he wants to forgive those who have done abuse to others. And he wants to restore broken hearts. So at the end of the message, we're going to have time. And I'm going to ask you to come and respond. And again, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to deal... I'm not just dealing with, with sexual things like rape and incest and molestation. I'm dealing with other issues from a cultural standpoint and, and, and things that have gone on in our lives that, that we need God's help. And just because someone comes forward today doesn't mean that they've had this happen to them, okay? That they've been abused or anything else. You can't assume a person's story, okay? We don't need information to pray with them. So no one's going to ask What's going on? What happened to you? We can pray in the spirit. We can just pray. Or you, can, you don't have to tell anybody for God to heal you. But I can't heal them. The only person that can bring healing to a person's heart is Jesus Christ. And the message title is only Jesus. Only Jesus. And only Jesus can heal our hearts and, uh, and address things deep within us. In Genesis 19, verse 30 to 38, the Bible says this, Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, our father is old, and there is no man around here to give us children, as is the custom of all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then sleep with him and preserve our family line through our father. That night, they got their father to drink wine and the older daughter went in and slept with him. Lot was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, notice that, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night, I slept with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight. And you go in and sleep with him so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also. And the younger daughter went in and slept with him. Again, he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. I want you to notice that the desire for children is a good desire, but they didn't trust God. They didn't have faith in God, and they took it into their own hands and they got their father drunk so they could have a baby. You know, needing financial provision for your family is an important thing, and God will provide. We would trust God and look to God. But to steal, to provide for your family, is not okay. The same way for these daughters to get their father drunk so they could have a baby so they, that they desired, which was not a wrong desire. It's instead of praying and trusting God and talking to their dad. So we need to trust God. I want us to pray. Father, help us.
Would you just pray, help me? Would you mean that, Father God, help me, Jesus, help me? If you need healing of heart in any way, Jesus, today, if there's anything that comes up in my heart to be healed, heal me. If there's anything in my heart that needs to be changed, change my heart, change my desire. Jesus, change my desire. Change, change how I feel. Change what I want. Change the way I think. Holy Spirit, you're free to move in my life. Bring me courage and strength by your Spirit. And restore us all, God. We're your children. I ask you to help us, Jesus. Be real, Lord. Sincere, deep in our hearts, we pray. Amen. It's a pretty uncomfortable portion of Scripture, I understand. But when you preach through a book of the Bible, you dare not jump over something to go. There's not something to speak to us because there is here. And very much. And I'm going to try to be brief. We're going to have some time at the end to pray. But the first thing you notice is that, number one, Lot was influenced by alcohol. Lot was influenced by alcohol. The Bible is clear that drunkenness is a sin. But what makes drunkenness more dangerous than many other sins is it also leads to compounding sins. Because a person's ability to make sound decision is diminished. And being drunk often leads to poor choices. In our text, we see Lot was even aware, wasn't even aware of what was happening to him. And as a pastor, I've heard a lot of stories about people that do things when they're under the influence of alcohol. They don't remember. They did things they wouldn't do if they were sober and so forth that caused them a lot of trouble. In fact, a friend of the family... Uh, her son is serving a 15-year prison because of something that happened while he was intoxicated. And I can tell you many stories. And I've counseled many married couples and things that have been said while someone was drunk and the problems caused. I've counseled children because they've witnessed inappropriate behavior because of alcohol. I've counseled people that have had similar experiences as a lot where they were taken advantage of while being almost a blackout drunk. And there have been countless one-night stands due to alcohol and drunkenness. And maybe you've experienced this in your own life. Where your consumption of alcohol led you to say something or do something you wouldn't normally in a state of mind do or say. And first off, I want you to know there's forgiveness and Jesus is the answer for you. And we can come to him and turn from any sin and repent of our sins. He's not wanting to, to compound the consequences that you maybe brought up on yourself and like go, you did this so here, you're gonna see all these other problems. That's not the heart of our God. There's no sin that's too great for the grace of God and his mercy. And the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for us is powerful enough to not just cover up but remove every sin and the guilt and the stain of the sin. So there's no lasting impact. He's here. He'll blot out the stain of your sin. So we turn to Jesus and we, we receive his forgiveness, his mercy and grace. Secondly, with love in my heart, I want to say, would you prayerfully go to the Lord and ask him if alcohol should be a part of your life? If it should be in your home. See, you can find research and even in Christian writings that, that justify drinking. You can find research that condemns it. And I'm asking you to stop looking at the standards of man and our culture and go to God and give him a chance to tell you his opinion about it and really pray. I, for one, if it was up to me, would encourage everyone to abstain from drinking. Like Solomon, who in the Proverbs said that when you see wine bubbly, red in color and bubbling in the glass, run from it. It's like a snake that in the end will bite you. You say, well, I've had a little wine all my life or I drink this every now and then. It never has bitten me. But let me ask you a question. Has your influence, are people seeing you? Has it bitten someone you love around you? My mother and father would have parties and people would bring alcohol. And when they would leave, they would leave their alcohol. They'd just stick it up in the counter. My parents didn't drink at home, but the alcohol was there. And both of my brothers became alcoholics because my parents allowed alcohol at parties in their home and it ruined their marriages and it about destroyed their life. And uh, 
I, I, I don't like it for many reasons. I don't like it because I've buried teenagers because what mom and dad do in moderation, children and teens will do in excess. And I buried teenagers from car accidents that were alcohol related. Turns my stomach. I've seen too much heartbreak and pain. A very high percentage of divorces are caused by alcohol being in a part of their life. And I've seen people lose their license, their jobs, their marriages, and it's just sad. Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think that wine or alcohol can be a cheap substitute for what the Holy Spirit gives us. And we don't need it. We need the relaxing, the freedom, the confidence, the boldness, the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit and not from a bottle. And it doesn't matter what you do. I'm going to love you. But it does concern me. If something, if alcohol or any other substance has a grip on your life, listen to me. You come when others come and let the Holy Spirit, let Jesus touch you and free you from dependency. If any chemical, he'll give his Holy Spirit upon you and, and just wash it away. And I truly believe that God will break those chains this morning if you just give him a chance and say, God, help me. So be ready to respond to the altar at the end of the, and receive deliverance and healing in the name of Jesus. First off, you see the influence of alcohol upon Lot. Secondly, you see the influence of culture in this story. Lot's daughters were heavily influenced by culture. Verse 31 of our text says, One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old and there is a man around here. There is no man around here to give us children as is the custom. The custom all over the earth. So I, I believe... And, and I, I, you know, it's in my perspective, Lot had gone, you notice in the text, it says they moved to a cave or to the mountains because Lot had just come from Sodom and Gomorrah area, remember? And God destroyed, and then he was, he was fleeing there, and he didn't want his daughters to be influenced by the culture and the sin that he saw bring so much destruction. And so he goes to isolate his girls in a cave to get them away from the cultural influences so they could not fall into that trap of, of, of the sin in that, in that time that was so, so full of sin. And so uh, he had, Lot had a fear to live in Zor. And he just witnessed the depravity that led to destruction. So instead of living among people, he decided he would seclude himself and his daughters to a cave because he feared that wickedness. You see, here's the problem. And everybody look at me and listen to this sentence if you hear nothing else. Listen to this. He thought it was wise by removing his daughters from the culture that's so sinful and from people. But Lot feared sin around him more than he feared the sin inside him. He feared the sin around more and he didn't teach his daughters that sin resides in the heart of man and only God can change the heart. Even though he eliminated the opportunity to sin, his daughter's desires had not changed. Let me tell you, I met several years ago with a bunch of seniors who interviewed me from Des Moines Christian and I asked them how different Des Moines Christian is from the secular schools. And you know what they told me? None that all of our classmates are sleeping around. You see, you can try to protect your children, but the truth is, is we need to teach our children that no matter where you're around, you can be in the church, you can have, be in a Christian family. If your heart isn't right, it's a heart. You can't cocoon and you don't teach your children to stand up and be full of Jesus and call on Jesus to be strong and to live a life that's pure before God. If all we do is eliminate parents, our opportunities for our children to make the mistakes, and I'm, okay, I'm good with keeping them away from certain things. Don't get me wrong. It's good to keep them away from influences, right? But we need to make sure we're looking at all the areas of influence, not just some, you know, 
See, because we got to fail, we can't fail to teach them that the threat of sin lies inside them. And when they do something, it's a heart issue. Instead of correcting behavior, that's not right. Talk about why would you do that? You know, where's going on in your heart? Point them back so they see they need Jesus. There's something wrong in the heart when we behave in a selfish, sinful way. So that we need a change of heart. Our children need a change of heart. Our grandchildren need a change of heart more than a change of scenery. A change of heart more than a change of scenery, although the change of scenery isn't wrong. Because sin, listen, sin will find its way into the safest cave You're not going to hide from it. Selfishness and sin lies within the heart, and only Jesus can change the heart. That's why we say it's only Jesus. Only Jesus can fix and help us. The second thing we notice in the phrase is, as is the custom all over the earth, we see the person allowing culture to dictate morals and ethics. Lot's oldest daughter believed that what she was doing was okay because that's the culture she was raised in. Everybody's got to have a baby. And there was no faith to believe that God would provide for them. And Lot was out of fear instead of faith pulling your girls away. And all was just a mess. It's just a mess instead of talking to their dad. It's so wrong. It does, it's not right. It's incest. And there are many customs today that are all over the earth that aren't okay. How about entertaining ourselves with, that portray, with things that portray sin and considered normal? Like watching movies that portray or suggest sexual activity outside of marriage. Or this, this show is really good, all but they have this little scene where there's these two men that kiss in the show. And our kids watch it. We're watching it. Or we have... Uh, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're watching things that, and, 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 believe, and in being entertained, even the Bible addresses that, not to be entertained by sin. Is it not just doing it, but, but, but enjoying the sins of others, like being entertained by it. What about the things that are considered normal, like, you know, in our culture, like dishonest in business or uh, on your taxes or in the workplace or at school cheating or in an interview lying, or they're considered normal in too many places. Holding unforgiveness in your heart is often considered normal. Having an all-you-can-get mentality, like get rich. It's all just okay and normal. A prideful spirit, you know, or a lustful thinking. It's normal in our culture. Having a Tinder account, having a Bumble account, have an okay Cupid account. I hope you don't know what those are. Considered normal. But just because something is normal doesn't make it right. You know what is not normal in our culture in America? Holiness. And the Bible says to be of the world, but be in the world, but not of the world. You live in it, but you're not of it. And if our world and the things you're seeing in business and in school and every place you go and on entertainment and in movies and, and all these things, if, if that stuff, if that doesn't make you uncomfortable, if that doesn't bother you, then something's wrong because something not holy should disturb us, should motivate us, grieve us. We're at the workplace, downtown, Court Avenue, the things we see in entertainment and television. Uh, you know, so I want you res- to respond to the altar today if God needs to realign your heart because you've accepted things and kind of rolled with things and you're, not, you're just slowly like the frog being cooked in the water. The water is warm and it turns up a little more and it turns up a little more and the frog is getting boiled but he doesn't jump out because it's so gradual that you've been baked into accepting the cultural sins that we live in that are just totally uh, 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 disgusting to God and he wants us to be a holy people and that's an unusual thing but you might need to be changed we, we can be in the world but we, didn't, we should never be of the world and only Jesus can change your heart to desire holiness to to be convicted at sin and then the last thing we see is we're influenced by not not just the custom not just the influence of alcohol and influence of the culture but the influence of the older sister 
32 and 34 both said the older daughter said to the younger. The sad reality is most time people are exposed to sin by someone older than themselves. I'm going to be vulnerable. Five times in my life before I reached the age of 20, I, I was a victim of abuse. It impacted me. Different types of abuse. You don't need to imagine what it was because you wouldn't know. And so long, long time I felt embarrassed because this happened to me. And all the times it was sometime someone older. Parents, if your students are middle school and they're running with high schoolers, you better make sure you know what you're doing because they can be headed for trouble. High schoolers running with young adults. And I'm not saying it's every case because there's some very godly older people, but be careful. Be careful. We have an obligation as parents to ask questions. We need to be an active parent. And as far as staying over the night, staying overnight, you know why I hate it so much? Because that was one of the times I was victimized when I was by a, a, another kid, a neighborhood kid. My parents didn't even know him, two years older than me. And I was victimized when I was eight years old. You know, kids are curious. Even if you have two kids that are Christians that you know their family well and you know you're trained them the same way, you put them overnight sleeping by each other, they're curious and they'll get to doing things and be curious and maybe do things that hurt each other. I highly advise don't be letting your children or grandchildren have overnighters. And if you do, put your child in your bedroom on the floor, lock the door and put the other kid in another room. People are often abused by a trustworthy person and exposed to sin by someone older than themselves. The sobering truth, Lot was the one who first exposed his daughter to the sinful culture. And we have a responsibility as leaders of our household to lead our children in a way of purity. And if we entertain ourselves with shows and movies and music that's sinful, then rather than normal, it messes up our kids. Our children have a hard time identifying what is sinful. If you're watching shows that normalize such things as vulgar language and blasphemy and sexual acts and glamorized vanity of alcohol, you're exposing your kids to things that potentially destroy their life. As a church, we need to value holiness again. Amen? Maybe there's a reason why you struggle with sensing the presence of Jesus during worship. You struggle with fear and taking God at his word and obeying God. It's because living in sinful life blocks the presence of God and the power of God in our life. And let me tell you, only Jesus, only Jesus can make you holy. For he is holy and there is no other holy. We need him. Would you bow your head with me? Let's all stand together. The Bible calls us to make our bodies a living sacrifice. We come before Jesus. You close your eyes and bow your head and not look around. Meaning we give ourselves to Christ so that he can work in our hearts. And God is not asking you to do heart surgery on yourself. You can't. Only Jesus can do that. And his spirit is here. So allow Holy Spirit to speak to you today. Are there influences in your life that need to be surrendered? To Jesus? Have you allowed culture to slowly take grip on your heart and your way of thinking? Have you allowed culture to have influence in your home? Are you tired of carrying the weight and guilt and shame of traumatic experience? If you've been a victim, are you ready to move on and truly forgive and give it to Jesus and let him heal you? What do you need? It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus that can do anything. Only Jesus can set you free from the influence of alcohol, drugs, tobacco, vaping, whatever.
Only Jesus can set you free from the grip that culture has on your heart. Only Jesus can set you free from the influence of a person in your life. Only Jesus can bring healing to your deepest wounds. Only Jesus can bring power to forgive someone that hurt you beyond measure. To forgive. Only Jesus can help you forgive. Only Jesus can restore your mind of the horrible experiences and the memories that are embedded there and restore you and erase the images. Only Jesus can erase those images or videos you've been exposed to by someone older perhaps. Only Jesus can heal your family wounds and your childhood trauma and only Jesus can help you lead your family to a path of holiness. His grace is no end. His mercy is great. His love consumes us. Like the Jesus Revolution, this is a safe place. We're family. This is, we're family. We love each other. And so we come and say, Jesus, you're our helper. We all, we all can look good on the outside, but God, whatever's going on, on the inside, we give it to you. And as people respond, I'm going to ask people that don't need to respond to anything to respond to free other people that do to respond. So in other words, if you're standing here, and you have zero thing to come to this altar or respond, I'm asking you to respond. Be the first one out of your seat so others that really do need to respond will feel freedom and nobody knows who's here responding just to respond, say, I always want more of Jesus, or responding because they have hurts. The words of this song, I run to the Father, are exactly what I want you to remember because it's God, it's Jesus that has the answer. Would you run to Him? So as the musicians that lead this song, Right from the beginning, I'm going to ask you to step out and come here and let's reach out to Jesus and let him touch us and do whatever he needs to do in our hearts. Don't be asking, how can I pray for you? If you come to pray with someone, don't ask, how can I pray for you? Just pray in the spirit. Just pray. Let's, let's sing it right now, Pastor Brett. Sing the words and start coming right now.